financial services in this integrated world. Um, and I think that it enables and empowers other sectors um, that are really beneficial for um, uh, users across the globe. Um, from my perspective, you know, fintech can revolutionize financial services um, and indeed uh, answer the old elephant in the room question, financial inclusion for what? Um, because fintech is um, in, enables us to embed financial services in real world economy activities, whether that is health or agriculture or education and so on. Um, and we'll discuss um, uh, agriculture and uh, micro and small enterprise a little later in the in the webinar. Um, but before we do, I wanted to run past you um, a, a concern that we at MSC uh, work on significantly, the other elephant in the room, perhaps we should have a different animal, the gorilla in the room, uh, which is which is the digital divide. And I'm sure in Nigeria you face this challenge as well, where large elements of the country don't have the infrastructure, whether it's electricity or um, mobile coverage to support fintech. Um, many, many people uh, across the developing world in particular um, don't have access to smartphones. We just finished um, some work in Côte d'Ivoire, and only 20% of, of cashew farmers, for example, have, have smartphones. Um, then obviously there's the cost of data. Um, buying those data packages is often very expensive. Um, then there are a significant number of people, nearly um, uh, 800 million as a bare minimum, who are not literate or numerate, so struggle with the traditional interfaces. Um, and of course, many of them um, want some degree of uh, physical interactions and can't cope just with the digital interface. Um, and of course, these people are uh, open to all sorts of abuse um, and need consumer protection and assistance with data privacy. And I think particularly around uh, consumer digital credit, we've seen a lot of a lot of challenges. What has been your experience of those those types of issues and how do you see fintech playing a role in the broader economy? Thank you, Graham. So we have similar challenges in Nigeria. I mean, for example, uh, we're a population of 200 million people, um, out of which about 100 million should be financially inclusive. And currently we have over 40 million that are not financially inclusive. So, I mean, that's a huge, a lot of factors affect that. I mean, there are illiteracy issues. I mean, there are infrastructure issues. Um, interestingly enough, we have about 170 million uh, cell phone penetration, but majority don't have smartphones. Uh, to deal with that, um, we use the what you call the USSD uh, solution, which has worked. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then you have some complications such that you have in some communities, maybe about uh, four or five people use the same cell phone. So you just swap their SIM cards. <laughs> so so you, have, you have those challenges. But we have, we have infrastructure issues. There's what you call the right of way in Nigeria, where state governments charge telcos for laying cables and setting up masks. And that's been a major issue that has affected uh, infrastructural development in some a lot of the rural areas but that has been that has been resolved right now i mean talking about fintech fintech is uh, critical and uh, and for us so i work with the association for us at the association our definition of fintech is any institution that is providing technology to that is using technology to provide convenience and service so mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter where you, so we have about 20 sectors in our association, agri tech, head tech, health tech, blockchain, you know, payment, but payment is foundational for any uh, digital uh, system to work. Because if yeah. you're in health tech, if you're in insure tech, if you're in, people have to pay for your services at the end of the day. And without a strong payment foundation uh, structure, uh, that will make it rather 
impossible. So uh, even the, pay, the fintechs, they, they need to work together with the other sectors to ensure that, I mean, it, 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 their, their services are, are easily done. I mean, good solutions, payments are made as fast, as quickly as possible. Merchants get their payments, you know, and so it, it's critical. I think that fintech cannot work in isolation. It has to work together with all other sectors for a larger economy, a larger digital economy. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean that makes that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And I mean, if 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 we turn to to that, and 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 particularly. Um, how fintech enables small business and micro business. Um, you know, we just completed a study um, of the impact of COVID um, uh, on, on micro and small enterprise. Uh, and we did this in Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Kenya, Philippines, and Senegal. Um, and what we saw was, first of all, that economic adversity was, was much more pronounced amongst uh, female respondents, about 69% of women compared to 58% of, of men had said that their incre uh, income had decreased. Um, but we still see a relatively low level of adoption amongst these micro and small enterprises. Only about a fifth of, of them had established um, partnerships with e-commerce platforms or indeed um, even used, you know, basic uh, social media like Facebook or, or WhatsApp. Um, this does vary from country to country, unsurprisingly, and maybe you'll be able to tell me that in Nigeria, the situation is, is, is much better. Um, but I, I wonder, from your perspective, what we need to do to enhance the use of technology in that uh, micro and small enterprise uh, arena, um, and and you know, I mean, I'm I'm really intrigued to see whether this is a, an issue in in Nigeria as well. So it, 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 it's it's an issue. I mean, look, in Nigeria we have about forty six million SMEs, and uh, only just about five. 10% of them have access to credit. Right. So, um, a lot of the micro group all have these same challenges. I mean, the, the issue of infrastructure still comes to play, literacy and uh, and smartphone issues still, still come to, to play out. But one, one of the things that has been done, especially in the agricultural sector, is to put the farmers into groups. And as you put them into groups, they are financially included. They go into the main banking system, you know, and uh, in some cases they're even given uh, phones so that they can uh, they can communicate, they can do transactions, they receive their payments by transfers, you know, so uh, capacity yeah, in terms of knowledge is critical. So they are all trainings that go on for some of them. But in terms of the trading public, that's been um, the, where the challenge is. I mean, the woman who sits by the side of the road, you know, selling things, you know, how do you get them to uh, to adopt technology for, uh, for their business? However, there's been a lot of progress in terms of COVID taught a lot of people lessons. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so during the lockdown, People could not transact except people who had e-commerce uh, platforms. So what we noticed is that a lot of the um, middle middle class uh, young people who are running private businesses have now adopted e-commerce. So there's been a lot of uh, adoption of e-commerce, but we see that more with the uh, at least slightly educated and highly educated the, the, the middle class as against what you see at the uh, towards the grassroots, but I'm sure that, uh, but, we'll, but we'll note that even in the grassroots, they are beginning to adopt the use of cards because COVID really taught us a lesson. Because <laughs> <laughs> people were stuck, they couldn't. I mean, the, the ATMs were empty because you needed to load the ATMs to be able to draw cash out of them. So you had those, those challenges too. So uh, COVID has helped with e-commerce adoption, 
but not at the rate at which we we'll expect it to to happen. I mean, it has affected adoption has been high with a particular class, but not with a certain uh, category. But well, I guess that right. uh, it's an ongoing process. It won't happen. I think uh, digital adoption is really more of a marathon rather than a dash. Yes. Yeah. 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 No. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and your banking sector is rolling out a very significant number of um, agents that will serve all the banks, if I understand correctly, in 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 Nigeria. Is that a, a shared agent network um, that will help fintech in the in the future? Yes. So there's actually a, a shared agent agency that was set up by the central bank that coordinates yeah. all of that. So you need to actually be registered with them to apply. So you have various categories. You have what you call the super agents, and then you have agents that are under the super agent. So the banks too also have that. Fintechs have that. So it's uh, there's a huge collaboration going on, going on there for for inclusion. Uh, Good. Oh, that sounds that sounds very positive. I mean, um, there's an interesting shared agent network in Uganda, um, which which also has has had some problems. Um, but I think the fact that the Central Bank of Nigeria has coordinated this and is driving a lot of it um, is a really important, uh, you know, um, uh, approach because I think some of the problems in in Uganda are around um, disputes over. Um, fees and the division of fees and so on as one would expect of course um so so you know you need a referee shall we say oh um, we, we, we have similar issues here so i mean why why the um fees some have been left to be flexible so where they are flexible the agents are times almost like sharks you no know, because people don't have a choice but to but to patronize them. So if you're in a rural area, so let, let me give you a typical situation in Nigeria. You have communities where they are five hours away from a bank. And uh, to be able to get money, to, to, to draw money, what they do is, so you might have 20, 30 people who will give one person all their ATM cards or their debit cards. The guy wow. goes and collects cash on behalf of everybody and comes back. So, um, but agents, banking is now coming into all those areas. But because of those distances, the agents charge an arm and a leg. So if you want, need cash, you pay a premium for it. If you do the transfer, I mean, it, it's, uh, those are, the charges are fixed. But where you want to draw cash and the agent is going to give you cash, you pay a premium for it. So those, that's where you have those disputes here. And that's because right. they are cash based, uh, cash based transactions. So I think it's a general problem when it comes to, <laughs> Uh, charges you know that uh, some part of it are left to be at the discretion of the of, of, of the agents in a way or oh, perhaps not left to but the agents take the discretion I think is <laughs> yeah we see this worldwide <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it undermines the trust in agent networks of course this is the real problem because people know that they shouldn't be charge these unauthorized charges but but um really have no alternative um, which is which is quite, quite true quite true just, just going back to the msmes um I, I i see that the mastercard center for inclusive growth and caribou digital have just launched this big uh program to educate um owners of uh micro and small enterprises on digitization of their um, of their operations. It's called the Strive program. Can you see what role fintech might play in, in that and, and how, um, you know, how difficult will it be to overcome the challenges you talked about earlier in terms of adoption by these relatively small um, market women or small shops or whatever? So you have um, a fintech like Paystack in Nigeria, and what they've done is right on their site, you can actually register, and they, they probably give you like uh, an ID, a reference number, and once you're plugged onto their uh, platform, you can actually do your e-commerce transactions on their platform, making it easier to reduce uh, the cost for, uh, and it's a free service for the uh, ah. 
for the MS for the MSMEs who want to log on onto their platform. Uh, because you know, to, to do e commerce, you have to start thinking I have to have an A, maybe a website. I have to, mm -hmm. because you probably don't need all of that. Just register with your bank details and your account company name, and you can actually plug in on their system and do your uh, your e commerce transaction. So, like, I'm, I expect that we'll see more more fintechs uh, who have uh, exchange platforms, who have switches. I mean, providing similar services with time, you know, and uh, that will get more um, MSMEs to uh, adopt the uh, more, more e-commerce uh, uh, business strategies. Oh, that's cool. That's very good. Because, of course, I mean, the big platforms like um, Jumia and so on take a fairly large chunk of the, of the revenue, and that's the big problem for, for small business owners, isn't it? Well, I mean, so I'm not sure it is because um, what really will take a lot from uh, the, the small businesses is logistics mm -hmm. and delivery. And, uh, what co True. and what COVID did is the fact that because of the challenges of moving around and people in logistics could move around, a lot of companies were incorporated providing logistics services at discounted rate compared to what you get from big uh, logistics companies like the FedEx and the DHLs and what have you. And that has really spurred e-commerce, e I mean, a lot. So the, 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 what they offer in terms of pricing is very, very, very reasonable, you know, and uh, that that's really peaked competition for the likes of the Jumia, really. Fascinating. The entrepreneurial spirit of Nigeria lives well through even through pandemics. That's great. It's, it, it, I mean, it, it was it was actually. I mean, the people selling motorbikes made a whole lot of money because. I mean, I, I'm sure if, if we have the statistics, I don't have the data, but I can bet that no less than 50, 60 companies will have registered for logistics services across across the country. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think. COVID, of course, has been absolutely horrible and a disaster for so many people, but it has spurred um, the growth of the digital revolution and and many different facets of it. Um, you know, I I know that from our our work, um, thirty eight percent of people. Um, more men than women, 43% of men and 31% of, of women. But in total aggregate, 38% of people, um, reported a, an increase in their, in their digital engagement, for want of a better description. So, you know, this has been, I don't know whether it's a kick up the backside or, uh, a, a pro, they always say that you should never waste a good, uh, disaster or, or, or challenge. And, um, perhaps COVID has provided that for the, for the fintech world and, and the digital revolution. You mentioned earlier, um, agriculture. And I wonder whether we should talk briefly about agriculture because for me, this is one of the most exciting areas because the opportunities for for tech in agriculture seem um, particularly big um, if we can overcome the issues that we talked about around the digital divide. Um, not only for just payments, not just for credit, not just for insurance, but also for the whole um, quality assurance around seeds and uh, pesticides and fertilizers, quality uh, tracking um, goods going to market using blockchain and so on. I mean, just an extraordinary range of opportunities. What sort of things are happening in Nigeria in the context of, of agriculture? So um, in the context of agriculture, we're beginning to see a few biotech companies. Mm -hmm. um, there's bio crops that's focused on seeds to ensure that... Uh, so let me give you a, 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 a case. In Nigeria, they try to export yams and we have cases where they've been turned back. And that's because the typical farmers, they grow their yams from yam sets. Now, yam mm -hmm. sets do carry diseases which can be transferred from one generation to the other. But these guys are beginning to produce yam from 
So they're beginning to produce yam seedlings. So instead of yam seeds, you're actually planting seedlings that have been through biotechnology and aeroponics processes, completely disease-free, a new generation of yams for, 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 for the market. Uh, they're also doing it with sugarcane, with, with rice, you know. So there's a lot going on in terms of, uh, they're working on seeds. There's another company called Upepsia. They call, they're, they're, they're in food production and they call them their soilless lab. So everything is greenhouse based, you know, and uh, they're using hydroponics and, and aeroponics for, for food production. I mean, I'm one of those who think that the, the problem with agriculture for food security, especially for Africa, is not a mechanization problem, it's a technology problem. We need to adopt biotech to be able to feed ourselves. Population will always grow faster than food production. So we need to start looking at those issues. I mean, in Nigeria today, one of the things I want to divide the country is called uh, grazing, uh, which has to do with, I mean, the particular tribe in the north, the Fulanis that rear cattle. During the dry season, they come all the way to the south for pasture, you know, and in recent times, it's become violent where they've killed people, take over people's land, destroy farmlands, the, the place of animals feeding. And so, look, that's the technology is a solution. Without technology, we can produce enough pasture without them having to leave where they are, either with the wet season or the dry season, and even export. You know, they just need to have drones to deliver pasture to wherever they are. You know, and so, so, so there's a lot that technology can do within the agricultural space. Um, and I hope that uh, we, we get there. I mean, I'm one of the big challenges in, in, in Africa, I think, is the fact that most of the people in, uh, in governments and even attempts in regulation belong to the analog generation. And uh, being able to cross that digital divide, it's been a, been a challenge, you know. While they talk about it, the, they are not, their DNA is not configured to, <laughs> to implement it. So you have those challenges. But, but I think that for, for Africa to be able to feed itself, biotech is the way to go. That is fascinating. I, I, I still remember when I first first uh, moved to Kenya when I was working there, and uh, the Maasai had all moved all their cattle into Kenya, so in the into Nairobi, so in the city, the capital city, the cattle were grazing on you know the verges and 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 so on because the the land was so dry at that time. And what you're describing, it sounds as though you have very similar issues in Nigeria, and I know obviously it occurs elsewhere in Africa. And if indeed we could we could address that through some of the uh, approaches you're talking about, that would be fantastic, fantastic. Is uh, How far are we away, do you think, from that being a real and cost-effective option? I would say very far, um, because for that to happen, you need to have government actually believe in it. I'm mm -hmm. willing to invest in it. I mean, there are a lot of, we have the unemployment rate in Nigeria is high, it's about 32%. You know, and so you, we can engage people doing good work in laboratories and pro, uh, pro producing pasture. Look, the, the pasture, uh, the, the cattle value chain in Nigeria is about 8 trillion naira. It's a huge value chain. So, I mean, why won't you invest money on technology to solve that problem. But yeah. you need to I have people in government believe in it because uh, the private sector would do it. So for one challenge, the, 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 the cattle areas are being used to free grass. You probably can't get them to start to pay for pasture. Yeah. So yeah. government needs to invest in it, employ people who produce the pasture and you deliver to them. And, and presumably, um, if if you do that, they will be able to keep their their cattle in 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 better shape. And um, because I mean, certainly, again, in <laughs> in Kenya, one of the biggest problems that the pastoralists face is is um, a when there's significant drought and, and a substantial proportion of their herd die. But even if they don't die, they waste and and um, building their 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 herd's um, strength back up again becomes a real challenge. So one can imagine that they might be willing to pay some amount at least. Well, I mean, uh, that, that would be the ideal thing. 
But knowing the way uh, I mean, our own environment is in Nigeria, it's going to be a challenging, going to yeah. be a challenging one. But, but I, I think that with time, so if, if you run those experiments and this guy can see that their animals get more meat value, they produce better milk by not moving around. Uh, and then you now tell them to pay extra. Maybe, yes, they might be willing to, to do that. But that's the wrong road ahead. Yeah, yeah. What about more immediate solutions uh, with ag tech in, uh, in Nigeria? Do you have any things that are already being deployed? Well, I mean, there are some interesting, especially in the commodities area. I mean, you have commodity platforms. So, I mean, I don't have to buy... I can invest and buy just some commodities and trade, you know. And so you have a lot of uh, e-platforms coming up where, and then platforms where you are linking farmers to uh, manufactur manufacturers. So you have a lot of, a lot of that uh, ongoing. Uh, the, the, the fintechs are trying to come into that space in terms of lending, but the cost of funds of fintechs is quite, of the fintechs are quite high. Um, you have uh, the central bank provided intervention funds in the agricultural sector, which comes as single interest rate digits, um, which is more um, interesting to the farmers as against the rates that fintechs will go. Fintechs are faster in terms of tire, uh, delivery and approvals for, for loans compared to what you have from the traditional, from the conventional banks. You know? yeah. So. So you have you have you have those those challenges. But I think that I mean, like I said, it's a marathon. We scale one, scale another, and and then we eventually get there. One of the things we try to tell the uh, the community is the fact that there has to be collaboration between incumbent banks and fintechs. Uh, places where the incumbent banks can be, fintechs can 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 get there. You know, and uh, we need that collaboration to be able to achieve uh, those um, objects, especially within in terms of financial. And credit to to farmers in the rural areas. Yeah, yeah. And um, do you have um, buyers platforms in the same way um, as, for example, Digifarm in in Kenya? So, uh, Digifarm is is um, promoted by Safaricom, and it is a platform um, that that provides information to farmers but also allows them to buy and sell and um, also then uh, basis that they should be able to get financial services and in particular credit to support their productive activities. Do you have that sort of thing in Nigeria yet? Yes, we, we have a couple of them who, who, who do that. You have FX Commodities, you have um, Vorian Corelli, you have um, Cellulant, that provide uh, those, those services within the agriculture. There are a couple of small fintechs who are trying to do, do that. I mean, being able to link farmers, buyers all together uh, on, the same, on the same platform. And, and, and how about uptake and usage? Because I think this is one of the biggest problems with these uh, platforms. Even, even Digifarm, with, with all the power of, of Kenya's largest telco, behind it only has a, depending on how you measure it, between a 14 and a 29% um, usage rate. And the 29% is really, you know, fairly generous. It's when someone uses it, you know, once in a blue moon, shall we say, rather than regular usage. Do you have that same problem in Nigeria? And do you have any magic bullets you could share with the world to <laughs> overcome those challenges? Well, I mean, those, so you have, those challenges are there. I know that uh, a lot of the high-end supermarkets have been able to have direct supplies from farmers, especially people who run like greenhouses and things like that, you know, to, to make that interaction easier. At the lower end, you have a lot of uh, middlemen who take it off the farmers, and then they now become the ones that bring them onto those, um, onto those platforms. Those platforms, oh, only, yeah. those platforms actually work better in the cities. And um, yeah. I, will, I, will, and I will say like just four, four cities within the country, Lagos, Abuja, um, Potakot, 
you know, and uh, not even in, I'm not sure he even works in a place like Kano, but, but I think that they, those three cities are probably areas where it work because of the um, working class in those areas, they're busy so they can be on those platforms, other things, I mean, my, we just sit down at home and we order all the food we need. And everything is delivered from a particular platform that provides and this, everything is fresh. So you, the, 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 it, it, it's working, but adoption, I don't have data on adoption, but I can, if we look at the population of the country and the population in those cities, and even in those cities, maybe, maybe 10, 20% is just what uses those platforms. So we could probably yeah. put it at about maybe 10%. <laughs> Back to the digital divide that we started on, I'm afraid. I, I, you know, so much of this is driven by those those six factors of of infrastructure and access, um, you know, to mobiles and, and 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 towers and and so on. So I think we should open it up to questions. We have um, one question already from um, Nehal Shah, who is asking about the um, e Naira. What is it and what is its purpose? And um, uh, does it have international restrictions when it comes to exchange? Okay, so the, the Naira is just a digital version of the existing Naira. Um, so it's a central bank digital currency. It's, it's a central bank digital currency. Yeah. And that's and that, and that just what it is. It doesn't attract any interest. It's just for, it's just fiat money in a digital format and uh, part of trying to develop a cashless economy uh, and it's wallet based i mean so that, 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 that that's just basically what it is for now and, and and so it's being used on a retail basis not on a wholesale basis yeah more for yeah for now it's going to be retail 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 basis i mean for merchants I will have to accept it for, 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 for payment, but it's more for retail because when they, they, there are limits to it. So there are different categories of retails. There are the, um, what you call the tier, the tier one group that can only do 20,000 naira or 50,000 naira worth of transactions. Then there's the mm -hmm. next level that can do 200,000. And then there's the next level that can do 500,000 naira and with a maximum limit per day. So, uh, it's purely, all well, intent and purposes, it's just retail. Right. Okay. 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 Because uh, one of the debates that's going on around CBDCs, uh, central bank digital currencies, is um, where to start with them. And, and there's a, a, a reasonable number of people who talk about using them to, to enhance uh, the speed and, and effectiveness of uh, wholesale settlements and, and so on. Um, because obviously you could build in um, smart smart contracts and so on and so on. Um, retail is is interesting, um, but one wonders what's the value add over mobile money or any other form of of digital exchange. Well, uh, I'm not sure there is any uh, difference. It's just for me, just the same. Uh, wallet, mobile money uh, based right. tr transaction. It's just that now it's actually a digital currency. Uh, that that uh, so what what, the, what you have existing at mobile money is what you call electronic money. Now they are now having digital. <laughs> We're not having digital currency. I mean, money is always evolved, has always evolved. So I mean, if yeah. you are looking at a digital uh economy then you should have digital currencies so i guess it's just uh but i really there's nothing you unusual i mean something i mean what was it called there's no advantage let me let me put it let me put it that way but i mean it's now a currency you have to you have to use but it will evolve i guess I guess the retail is probably the pilot and once they get that right, they can now scale it to wholesale and smart contracts and things like that eventually, I guess. And can it be used for FX transactions? No. No. Okay. There you are, Nehal. Your uh, answer is no, I'm afraid. 
Yeah, I mean, it's um, yeah, I, it'll be, it's really interesting to see how central bank digital currencies will evolve, um, because uh, a we're back to the digital divide again. A very substantial proportion of people, it is meaningless. Um, but I'm also intrigued as to see where the real value add over and above existing forms of digital currency lie. And I'm not yet convinced that I see that. Um, but let's hope. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the central banks are confusing. A digital currency cannot replace the crypto uh market uh but I, it's also uh crypto it's also another responsible government will allow two fiat currencies i think that exactly. crypto, cryptos should change from currencies to assets as a store of value for individuals and it can run as a store of value i mean on an exchange as against a currency and the, the, the central banks can run their digital currencies but it's not a substitute for crypto, so I mean, it's, it's just uh, <laughs> so if the whole idea is to try and compete with the crypto, I think it's a wrong approach by the central banks. Yeah, and um, but I think the distinction you make is really important and valuable. That that the crypto is can be useful as an asset, but frankly, will not be tolerated by central banks as a, 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 another currency. And um, I think the sort of the crypto warriors hate that reality, but it is absolutely true, and and they'll have to learn to live with it. Great. Well, it's. I think we're at the end of our time. I can see that we're about to be disciplined by um, the the organisers. So, Babatunde, let me thank you on behalf of all of all of the people who've tuned in, and for me personally, it's been a real delight to talk to you. And I'm sure that we'll be in touch. Um, you know, in the future. And all the very best. May Nigeria spawn many more unicorns. You already have had a couple. And <laughs> yeah, we have five sure now. more will come up. We have five now. <laughs> five already. Brilliant. Congratulations. Well, Thanks. may many more arise. Yeah, maybe ten. Thank you so much ten, for your ten time. more. <laughs> Great. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, Babadunde, and thank you so much, Mr. Graham. It was a lovely session and despite all the hurdles, we've managed to do it very well with all the questions coming in from the delegates. So thank you so much again for taking our time. Uh, uh, another thing is for the delegates as well as for our panel, here's a chance to become a proud owner of Rupee on the go. So basically you can visit the NPCI booth and apply for your complimentary Rupee on the go device. So please do check it out on our platform and let us know. Thank you so much again and I hope you guys are safe and please be safe and take care. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye Thank you. now. Take care.